you know, we're losing our cryosphere on this earth. The earth is becoming a much warmer place and the consequences are profound of how it will affect humanity. Welcome to today's Climate Emergency Forum, where important issues in the environment are discussed by today's leading experts. My name is Regina Valdez, and I'll be the moderator for today. And Tony over here is going to make sure that our discussion stays on topic and in line. So today, crisis in the cryosphere. What is the cryosphere? It is the unmelted water that surrounds us surrounds us on this planet. That frozen water has been stable for thousands of years, but that's all of a sudden changing. What are the effects that it will have on us and generations in the future? Well, we've seen that towns such when the most recent uh, melting of the glacier and the Himalayas have been completely subsumed by water, flooded completely, homes lost, lives shattered, dreams completely eroded along with the rocks, trees, the soil, and everything that lives and depends upon it. So it's a frightening, frightening concept, especially when we see the increasing melting that's occurring at the Arctic. What is it that we can do? Is there any way to adjust to this? In order to answer these questions, I would like to introduce Paul Beckwith, Paul is a climate system scientist, and he's taught at the University of Ottawa in the Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, as well as at Carleton University. Paul, what do you have for us on this topic today? Well, I think that um, the Arctic is kind of the um, linchpin, if you like, of the climate system. And the warming in the Arctic is greatly accelerated compared to the uh, global climate average. So warming, as you go up to higher and higher latitudes in the Arctic, the warming becomes that much greater. If you take the overall Arctic, it's at least three times fast, faster warming than the global average temperature. And as you go to uh, north of say 80 degrees, 85 degrees, it's more like eight times faster, the warming. And the reason is, is because the Arctic is becoming uh, a much darker place. As we lose the snow cover on the land surfaces, the land underneath is uncovered and because it's darker, it absorbs that much more solar radiation and heats up rapidly. Same with the Arctic sea ice covering the dark ocean underneath. As we lose less, as we lose more and more Arctic sea ice, the more and more of the ocean underneath is exposed and it's a very dark color. So the average reflectivity of the entire Arctic region has actually decreased from about 52% of the incoming light, that's the albedo number, to about 48%. And that's over a time period of two to three decades. So this, uh, this feedback is called Arctic temperature amplification and, and greatly increases the melt rates. Now, as we lose more and more sea ice, the sea ice acts as a quart or a buttress on, on ice calving from Greenland. So the ice shelves extend out from the continent of Greenland and they're extremely thick ice. And uh, as there's less and less sea ice to hold them in place, they expand out further and further into the ocean and um, there's a lot more calving that can go on. And of course, the loss of ice from Greenland and the loss of ice from Antarctica greatly contributes to sea level rise increases. Now, up to now, most of the sea level rise is because of expansion of, of the um, water in the ocean. And when, when it, it, you know, higher temperatures, it expands and occupies more of the ocean basin is causing sea level rise. But the doubling rate of ice melt 
on Greenland and Antarctica has is has is about seven to ten years. So every seven to ten years, the melt rates doubles on these continents, and and that greatly is uh, contributing to sea level rise now, and will very soon overpass the effect from the expansion of the ocean water. Also in the Arctic, we have tremendous regions of huge, vast areas of permafrost on the land. And as we get warmer and warmer temperatures, air temperatures, the temperature, the, the thermal energy is going deeper and deeper into the permafrost, thawing out more, you know, th thawing it out to deeper and deeper depths. And of course, the organic matter that's stored within is then subject to bacterial decomposition, which is which then releases methane um, if if it's in sort of a marshy area or CO2, and also nit nitrous oxide is also being released. So all of these sort of things feed back into melting more and more of the Arctic. So we're losing the Arctic is the refrigerator of the planet, if you like. Um, of the northern hemisphere and we're losing more and more of that refrigeration ability. So the jet streams have slowed down and weakened um, and become more meridional. So they extend now farther into the north and into the north and south directions. And when they go far north, they actually can go right up to the, or to the North Pole in the dead of winter and bring very, very warm moist air up there in the dead of winter and and by the same token the jet stream troughs go so far south texas just experienced um you know an extreme cold spell very unusual because the jet streams went so far south the cold dry air spilled out of the arctic and went down into the deep south so whether it be hot humid air going up into the arctic or cold dry air leaving the Arctic, both effects cause a greatly increased Arctic warming. And uh, so, you know, we're gonna have a summer, a September very soon when there's no Arctic sea ice left at all. Um, the minimum of, is normally about mid-September and we're gonna have a September where there's no sea ice whatsoever. And once that happens, of course, it takes longer for the sea ice to form in the fall and winter. So it's thinner and thinner in the winter seasons. And therefore, you know, it'll melt out earlier in the summer seasons. So the first year, I call it a blue ocean event. There'll be no Arctic sea ice in September. And then within a few years, that will extend on to a month on either side. So August, September, October, no sea ice. And then add another month on top of that within a few more years and within a decade, I expect there to be no sea ice at all in the Arctic. And then that energy that goes into melting the ice, right? When there's a huge amount of energy in the Arctic and there's ice, most of that energy goes into melting the ice, not raising the temperature. The temperature is pegged to the melting point to just above the melting point of the ice. But when there's no more ice, then all that energy can go into uh, raising the temperature of both the ocean and the air above it. And that will greatly, you know, that will greatly accelerate the warming in the Arctic. Um, it'll, you know, far beyond what it is now. And that has huge implications for weather patterns at lower latitudes and the unpredictability of our weather patterns and weather systems will be that much greater and it will become more difficult to grow food. There was a recent study that talked about the terrestrial tipping points. And the problem is, is when the temperature rises over the land, then the ability of plants to photosynthesize uh, decreases, but the respiration rate still increases. So the net result is that the land will tip over from being a carbon sink that captures carbon. Right now it captures about 30% of the carbon um, from anthropogenic emissions, and that will switch to being capturing only about 15%. So the actual rate of capture of carbon from land, from plants on land will actually halve, and that will 
that is projected to occur within as short as 20 years from now. So all of these factors are against us. We're in a climate emergency. We have to act with, we need a warp speed uh, operation for the climate, similar to the warp speed operation for creating vaccines to fight the coronavirus. Thank you so much, Paul. I really, really appreciate that metaphor that you use. Um, some people may assert that the virus that the planet's suffering from is humanity itself. But one of the things that is really uh, expressed itself upon me in your discussion is like these amplifying effects that each um, warming event has on the other. For example, the warming air is affecting the ice that is above the sea and the warming water is affecting the ice and eroding it and slowly melting it below the ocean. And of course, all of this is allowing um, greenhouse gases to further be in the air. So I wanna switch it over and see what Dr. Peter Carter has to say. Uh, he's the director of the Climate Emergency Institute. So Peter, your thoughts on this crisis in the cryosphere? Um, so thanks, um, thanks Regina. And I, I do want to briefly address the all important crucial question that you pose in your introduction, which is what can we do? Um, we don't get much in the way of answers, um, uh, recommendations on this published climate science. So uh, what can we stop burning stuff? Quite simply, uh, the burning age is over. If we don't end the burning age, if we don't force our governments to end the burning age, then uh, we are ended. And the other thing that we have to do is we have to stop eating meat. We had to go vegan. Um, uh, that's got a good amount of publicity recently. So two things we must do, and we really need to repeat that over and over. So on the cryosphere, the big uh, news from the science, uh, which was published in January of this year, which was absolutely staggering news, was the total amount of uh, planetary ice that is melting every year. And it is 1.2 trillion tons a year. I mean, I literally had to go back and, and, and look at the paper because this is so incredible, so hard to believe. And that, like everything else with the climate system, is accelerating. And it's accelerating because uh, our governments and corporations and economy is still pouring uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a also staggering rate. Um, the, sea, the ice melting in the 1990s was 760 billion tons a year. So now it's accelerating an increase to over 1 trillion tons a year. So the amount of heat that we are adding to the climate system is absolutely phenomenal. Um, uh, the ocean scientists say that it's equivalent to uh, detonating five, uh, five Hiroshima type atomic bombs per second. So we're, we're literally blowing up the planet with heat. I want to address the, um, what I'm most interested in with respect to the Arctic, especially, which is feedbacks. Um, climate is all about feedbacks and dangerous climate change is all about positive amplifying feedbacks. And there are very many and they're potentially enormous. And a lot of these feedbacks are actually tipping points as well. So the largest sources of feedbacks are in the Arctic and the largest number of tipping points are also in the Arctic and they relate to the Arctic cryosphere. Paul has already described very, very well the albedo um, sea ice feedback. If, when, if, when we lose all of that uh, Arctic, uh, Arctic Ocean sea ice, um, uh, the experts, Dr. Plistone, says that that's equivalent to one trillion tons of CO2. So phenomenal, phenomenal amount of extra warming surface heating going into the planet um, uh, when that ice disappears and nothing is being done. Nothing is being done to stop that. What is being done is everything to accelerate it, which is, um, uh, to put it mildly, is totally insane. So the other big source of uh, feedbacks, of course, is the permafrost. Now, the permafrost contains double the amount of carbon which is in the atmosphere. So we're talking a massive amount of permafrost. 
I mean, there's thousands and thousands of square miles. Um, the biggest region is Siberia, but there's a big region in, the, in um, Alaska and a big region in Northern Canada. So right now, the big, bad, terrible news on that is that the Arctic has actually switched from a carbon sink to a carbon source. For me, that was the most terrible news that I ever picked up. Um, it was published in Arctic Report Card. They, they covered more research and they repeated the, um, uh, um, the statement, which was very definite in their 2019 report card, the Arctic carbon sink has flipped. It is now a carbon source. And as with so many things, the more the science research is done, the worse we discover things are. And uh, that even compounds the fact, of course, that we are driving everything in a uh, catastrophic direction um, with respect to the climate system, right? So we're making things worse all the time and our research finds that things are actually worse than they ever thought before. So um, uh, the Arctic um, permafrost, as Paul alluded to, that's thawing everywhere, all the permafrost, there's been a big study on that. And um, uh, in some regions, it's definitely accelerating. The uh, permafrost thawing is releasing all three main greenhouse gases. It's releasing methane, but it's also releasing carbon dioxide and a lot more carbon dioxide. So this is an Arctic planetary total catastrophic situation from the permafrost alone. And that thawing permafrost, of course, is driven harder and harder by the fact that the sea ice is melting away and that's heating up the Arctic even more. We need the ice. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think, I don't know, that's, that's some terrifying news that you just gave us. Um, and, you know, it brings to mind several flaws of thinking that, that we tend to have. One is that we exist in isolation. And two, that someone's going to fix this. Some, someone somewhere is going to make it all better. And these two things seem to suggest a, a lack of depth of, of um, introspection, of knowledge about the world. And I would even assert uh, a degree of uh, spiritual um, infantilism. So with that, I would like to turn it back over to Paul. Yes, uh, thank you, <clears throat> Regina, and thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, so who, who's going to save us? I mean, a lot of us grew up on Saturday morning cartoons, and it was always Superman, right? In fact, there is one episode of Superman where Lex Luthor is, um, he, he wants to just, he wants to flood out the world, so he wants to melt all the ice caps. And Superman, of course, has to, I think he carries icebergs from Antarctica to the Arctic or something. Okay, there's actually this one episode, we should actually play it at some point. It's a really, it's a really good episode. But to um, enlarge on what, you know, I said earlier about the Arctic being a refrigerator, and Peter also talking about these feedbacks, the, if you look at the amount of energy to melt, say, a kilogram of ice, and then you end up with a kilogram of water, take that same amount of energy that melted that kilogram of ice and apply it to that kilogram of water that's just above freezing point, and the temperature will go up, would go up for that kilogram of water to 70 degrees Celsius. Just gives you an idea that once the ice is gone, then that heat is all gonna go into, we call it sensible heat, into raising the temperature as opposed to the latent heat of causing a phase change from the solid uh, liquid, solid um, water form to the liquid water form. So that's one thing. Also the permafrost is not just the permafrost on the land. I mean, many people have, have um, you know, understand that these large sinkholes have been appearing in the permafrost in, in Siberia and they're full of methane. Basically what it is is the, um, the frozen ground, if there's a lot of water content, 
in ice in the permafrost and the ice then melts, then the, the ground loses its rigidity and you can get these large sinkholes occurring. And people, local people see flashes at night sometimes. So the methane can reach a certain concentration where it just kind of explodes and blows out this sinkhole. We're also seeing that on under on on seafloor, these sinkholes appearing on the seafloor. So underneath these vast continental shelves in the Arctic, the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf, the water is only 50 to 100 meters deep, and the water is warming. Uh, Peter Wadhams, on some crew, on some of his research expeditions in the Arctic, has show, has, has shown that that the water is warm five degrees over the continental shelf. And then that heat is penetrating into the undersea permafrost. So we're getting more and more methane bubbling up through the water column going into the atmosphere. And if the water is shallow, then most of the methane will get up to the, up to the surface. So it's, it's not just methane from the bacterial decomposition of the organic matter, but there's actually something called methane clathrates, which are methane trapped within ice crystals. And when those ice crystals saw that that methane is released. So this is an enormous feedback for, for the Arctic. You know, we're losing our cryosphere on this earth. The earth is becoming a much warmer place and the consequences are profound of how it will affect humanity. Thank you so much, Paul. And I have to say, um, this wasn't planned, but you mentioned Peter Wadhams and I happen to have his book here, which I had, um, which I had been reading, planning for this particular discussion. And, uh, it, you know, his discoveries and what he's found in his trips uh, truly are um, astounding. And, and one thing that you said is that the implications of this melting um, ice or the permafrost, which of course doesn't melt, but it does, thaws. What, what is it? Um, thaws, thaws, it yeah. thaws, thank you, Paul. Um, and you had said that there were tremendous implications on humanity, agreed. However, I would like to also add that there's uh, tremendous implications for other living beings, especially those who depend upon um, a very narrow window of temperatures and, you know, this, this melting of the ice and the, how it's affecting the salinity and the temperatures is, can really devastate entire populations. Um, and I just, I wanted to throw that in. And Peter, what are your thoughts? Um, the way I am is, is there are two big catastrophic impacts which will happen if we continue to burn fossil fuels and burn wood and power plants, stuff like that. We, ha we have to stop. The science has been definite for years. We have to stop burning fossil fuels. We have to ban fossil fuels, okay? <laughs> we have to tell, say that over and over because not enough people are. Two things. One thing which is catastrophic for all of humanity, um, which is the collapse of our agriculture. Now, the Arctic sea ice in its natural historic state covers about 6 million square miles in the winter and 3 million square miles in the summer. As Jennifer Francis, who is an expert on this years ago, says, um, it's not a question of what will happen to the planet and particularly the northern hemisphere when the sea ice goes, um, there will be a huge change. The Northern Hemisphere climate will obviously be even further disrupted. We'll get more extremes of heat and also presumably extremes of cold. And uh, we'll get more heat waves and more droughts. And the, uh, the likelihood is that this will devastate the best agriculture on the planet and hence the uh, decline, fall of civilization, which depends entirely on agriculture. And um, some people will argue this, but one thing I know, we have to protect that agriculture. That's for sure. We have to maintain it and protect it and not get into hopeful fantasies about ad adapting our agriculture to a massive change in the Northern Hemisphere climate. Second thing is a catastrophic impact, and uh, Regina alluded to this already, to all of life on the planet. 
Now that impact we've called runaway for years and years and years. Runaway is not a term that scientists like to use and they hardly ever use, but it is definitely the worst catastrophic inevitable situation of all of the amplifying feedbacks acting together, particularly in the Arctic. So the scenario is not hard to imagine. Arctic sea ice disappears, heat in the Arctic increases, heat in the Northern hemisphere increases, thawing of permafrost accelerates faster and faster, faster. We get more and more and more methane, CO2 and nitrous oxide released and eventually everything collapses. It's a total planetary collapse. And we're in the sixth mass extinction of species already, which our industrial civilization has brought about by mainly deforestation and forest degradation. But that extinction is happening in all regions on the planet. It's not just in the tropical rainforest and the Amazon where the greatest diversity is. So those are the two things. Thank you so much. Well, I have to say, um, it seems like no exaggeration. I know biblically, um, and I'm not necessarily inclined, but biblically, the world is going to end in a ball of fire. And it seems as though we are um, really driving towards enacting that. Uh, I just want to announce that our mission is to increase public awareness and knowledge pertaining to abrupt climate change, the disruption of climate systems, and loss of biodiversity and biomass as well as presenting emergency solutions. If you like what you saw and you heard today, please subscribe to our channel. Meanwhile, thank you so much for joining. We'd like to hear your comments, so please leave them. And until next time, goodbye everyone. <laughs>